Studying Rahab was, uh, I did not expect to be as powerful as it was. It was a, somebody that God had put on my heart in the beginning to study, but um, in the very beginning, I, I thought, okay, God, Lord, you keep saying Rahab, you keep saying Rahab. But then as I kind of thought through her life, I thought, well, maybe there's not that much in there. And boy, I was so, so wrong. Um, we studied uh, Hagar last, year, last week, and in all honesty, she, she went through a lot of really hard things. And so it kind of put us in a place to have to think of those deep things. And not that Rahab doesn't, but her response and the things that God does through her are so powerful and so encouraging. It's almost like as we study this, like I, I want us to all just get like fired up, like, like a woot woot, like just one of those things where we're studying and we're thinking, okay, God, that's huge, that's powerful. So as we look into God's word, we think, okay, so who was Rahab? Um, we know she was a prostitute, um, but we know that she also was um, a prostitute that found a saving faith in God. In, a, in the place where she lived in the land of Jericho, she was among many non-believers. They worshiped many gods. Um, and she was the one person in that whole city that had heard of the God of the Israelites, and it began to change her. They all heard the same stories about the same God. They all heard about when he parted the Red Sea. They all heard about the plagues. I mean, the, the Israelites, how he brought them out of Egypt. And they all had heard these stories of this powerful God that moved um, the Israelite people, but yet it seems that only Rahab was actually stirred in her heart. Everybody else kind of put a deaf ear. And doesn't that kind of feel like sometimes today when we're talking to non-believers, we're telling them how great our God is. They're, they, they have the Bible, they have that history, and they just aren't getting it. Rahab got it. She, she came to the point in her life where she realized their God is different. Our gods we worship, we lift up, but they don't do a thing. It's like, I doubt they ever moved off the shelf that they had put them on in the little idols that they built. And so Rahab was seeing this and she was understanding it and it changed her completely. Think about being a prostitute, period, in that time, in any time. And I know this was a really corrupt society and I know they had temple prostitutes, but imagine what that must have looked like on a daily basis for Rahab. Imagine what she probably felt as the men who she lived on the wall of the city and so her house was very obvious to the people coming in and out and just think about the amount of men that were probably coming in and out of that home and so it was pretty clear what her house was about and imagine how she had to take in anybody who showed up at her door they're on long journeys, a little bit smelly. Like, just picture what her daily life looked like and the way maybe other women in the town looked at her. You know, did you see who went into Rahab's house today? I think I, that was somebody's husband. You know, and so picture her living this life. You know, it shows she was a woman that, that had other abilities. It showed that she that she made clothing, like she had those um, stalks of flax on her roof of her house for a reason. She was making clothing out of that. So this wasn't the only thing she was capable of doing, but it's what she chose to do to put a roof over her head. And I think where must she have been where she thought, well, I guess this is my only option. This is all I have that I can do. But the fact that that was what she was doing makes the story of Rahab that much more powerful because it tells us that Rahab's life is the perfect testimony that our sin no longer defines us. The fact that she got saved tells all of us, it doesn't matter where we came from, it doesn't matter what we have ever done, God doesn't see us as, what, as our sin any longer. The minute we accept him, our sin no longer matters to God. Sometimes we think it still does. We see that we are, it's not who we were before Christ that matters. It's who we are in Christ. Isn't that the most powerful thing? It's who we are in him. Her faith should be an example to each and every one of us. Her faith, she became very bold. Her testimony from the moment she believed became something that, changed not only the Israelites' life, but her life, and actually she left a legacy because of it. We see in Joshua chapter 2, chapter two and I want to just kind of do a, 
a little overview just for context sake so that we know um, what we're looking at in her life. Uh, Moses had died. And Joshua now was taking over kind of that baton. He was the one that was chosen by God to lead um, the Israelites into the promised land. And uh, the promised land was currently occupied by the Canaanites, and they were about to get evicted. And they're hearing of God's people. They're hearing that they're going to take the land. And so the people in the land are not feeling too settled about when they're coming, when they're going to actually take the land. And the Lord tells Joshua in chapter 1 that it's time to go in. So what does he do? Joshua sends out two spies. And the two spies go into the city, and the first place they stop is the house of Rahab. That was not by accident. I believe they were completely led by the Lord to go there. And she receives them in. And the minute she receives them in, or shortly after, the king gets wind that there are two men that have gone into her home. So it must have been pretty visual to be able, people must have been able to see pretty clearly what was happening. And so the king gets wind that she has brought them into her home and he knows they're the Israelites and he sends people to her house and says, like he tells them this big land. And when they arrive at Rahab's door, what happens? She tells them this big lie. She hides them in upstairs immediately and she tells them this big lie and sends them basically on a wild goose chase. Oh, they went that way and around that corner, and that's where you need to be. She hid them on the roof, and after the, after the king's men leave, what does she do? She goes directly upstairs, and she begins to have a conversation with these men, and she begins to talk to them, and they begin, she begins to tell them what the state of the heart of the men in that city is. And we find out, she tells them, the people here are faint-hearted. And that word faint-hearted is like their hearts melted because they knew what was inevitable. They knew that God's people were coming and they were terrified. But why were they terrified? Because they had heard that the God of Israel had parted the Red Sea. They heard about the God of Israel and all the things that, that he had done. And they knew that they were no match for him. So what's interesting for me to try and think through is, if they heard this, how could, and they were afraid, how come they didn't change? How come they weren't affected by Rahab like Rahab was? And it just tells me Rahab understood the power of God. She knew the power of God, and, and it changed her deep within. It says in verse 11, and I want us to look at this. It says, as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any courage in any one of us because of you. God told Joshua four times in chapter one, be strong and have good courage for I am with you. Be strong and of good courage for I am with you. Be strong and of good courage for I am with you. So when Joshua's coming in, what does he know? God's with me. Have courage. That courage, that word courage is like the spirit within him, like his breath, like it was everything about him. God's like, you can be strong in good courage because I'm walking right beside you. What was the word that Rahab used about the hearts of the people? It says, neither did there remain any more courage in any one of them. Same word courage. Why? Because without the power of God, we don't have courage. There's nothing we can do. Think about when when we're in a situation that's too big for us that we don't know how to conquer. Think as a non-believer, that battle that's too big, they can only operate with what they can do in their own strength. They can only operate in their circumstances, what they can control, what power they have personally. So what happens when they've reached the end of their ropes? They're defeated. Why? Because they don't have the Lord. See, what happens when we're in a position where everything is out of our control and we look and think, gosh, I can't move this mountain. There's nothing I can do in this situation. We have God. We have a God that can do impossible things. We have that courage because we know the power of God. Our courage comes from the power of God. The false gods they had, what could they do? They couldn't do anything. They couldn't move anything. They couldn't do anything. They couldn't save anyone. When did Rahab get saved? That was an interesting part of this study. The salvation, the salvation moment for Rahab is in the second part of verse 11 in chapter 2. It says, for the Lord, your God, this is Rahab speaking to the spies. She said, for the Lord, your God, he is in heaven above and on earth. He is the, I'm going to read it again because that was wrong. 
and this is important, it's salvation. It says, he is God in heaven above and on earth. She's proclaiming at that very moment, your God is God. He is the one and true God. There is nobody else but him that can move. There's nobody else that has the power but your God. So Rahab at that very moment, that's her telling the spies, like, I believe, I know, I know your God is the real God. Rahab's profession of faith at that moment changes everything for her. Her entire life changes at that moment. We see so many things happen. Every decision she makes after that is changed. The things she would have done before, she doesn't do now. She's now obedient to the instructions that they give her. She's willing to take risks, and I think, she took some huge risks for God. I mean, she put her own life in jeopardy. And I think, when was the very last time I took a big risk for God? And we should be thinking of that, like, when's the last risk we ever took? Probably for me, standing here in front of you might be the biggest risk that I'm taking. But the truth is, I'm not terrified that if I blow it, you guys, someone's going to murder me in the parking lot, you know? <laughs> like, it's not that big of risk. It's like, what, what's the worst thing that can happen to me? Rahab took risks that mattered. And it tells us, you know, that no matter, this tells me that no matter where any of us came from, no matter where any of us were before, that this is the potential of our walk once we're saved. We have the same potential Rahab had. We have the same ability because we have the same exact God. Our God is no different. You know, we don't have to um, be afraid, you know, that, that God isn't going to be there for us because we know in his word he says that he will. And because of Rahab's faith, what she's mentioned in, in Matthew 1 in the lineage of Christ. She's met, mentioned in Hebrews 11 in the hall of faith. She's mentioned in, in James 2 for the work that she did for the Lord. And we have to start thinking like, no matter where we were before God, we now have the potential of Rahab. I'm telling you, I studied this and I got super fired up. I thought, I can do stuff for God. Like, he can use me in whatever way he needs to use me. And all I have to do is show up. You know, what I believe affects what my life looks like, right? Doesn't your belief in God for, affect everything that you do? And I think of like, I was raised, I was, I was relating to, to kind of the, the, the men in Jericho or the people of Jericho. I was raised going to Catholic school my whole life. I, I heard about God, I knew about God, but it didn't change me. And it's not, I'm not saying anything about being Catholic because I have some amazing, loving family members that are Catholic that love the Lord. That's not my point. My point is, God didn't meet me there. Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't change because of God because I went to Catholic school. That's not, the, that's not what caused me to have a belief in God. It was something God had to do deep within me. It's just like, you know, you can be raised in a Christian home. And that doesn't guarantee if you raise your children in a Christian home that they're going to know the Lord. Because, you see, God has to speak to each one of us individually. God has to, to deal with each one of us. And sometimes... We feel like, oh, if we just do all the right things, you know, everything's going to be good. No, God wants to get to our hearts. God wants to speak to each one of us. Rahab had a faith that caused her to act. She wasn't stagnant by any means. Our faith should be calling us to action. Each one of us, our faith should be calling us to action. She hid the spies, and she could have gotten killed. Think about that. Like when she took them in, she had to believe enough in their God to know they could find out they were here and I could be dead. She didn't cower in fear because of the people around her. She didn't let them influence her to the point that it changed the way she behaved. That's hard to do, right? In this society, sometimes it's hard to stand up for our faith. We get it from every single end, don't we? Like now it feels like as a Christian, it's not so good. People don't like you as well. You've become a hater. If you don't agree with abortion, well, you must hate. You know, if, if you don't agree with homosexuality, then you must hate. It's like, no, I'm trying to follow the word of God, and it's so hard, but we have to be bold now more than ever to stand up for our faith. This is the time where we're really being called. Like, I'm thinking 30 years ago, people knew a little bit more wrong and right. Nowadays, it's like, if we don't stand up as believers, who's going to? We need the faith of Rahab. She was bold when she asked the spies. I love how she kind of just lays out there what, what I think we all would want to do. It says in verse 12, 
Now therefore, I beg you, swear by the Lord, since I have shown you my ki- shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness to my father's house, and give me a true token, and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sister, and all um, that they have, and deliver our lives from death. Isn't that so true that the moment we get saved, what's the first thing we want? We want our family members saved. We want everybody to know the power of God, because what's the alternative? It's hell. That's the alternative for him. So our love for God and our love for them draws us to the place where we want them to know what we now know. That's what Rahab's doing. It's faith into action. She didn't let her past determine her future. She didn't say, well, I'm a prostitute. I'm good for nothing. God can never use me. You know, what's he going to do with me now? She was a hot mess. We're a hot mess. We don't always have to be a hot mess. See, we have Christ, and that's the difference for us. Um, it says in verse 14 that this was the response um, of the spies. It, she had to actually have some sort of a um, responsibility. And when she tells them, will you hide my family, this is what they come back to her and say. It says, if you tell no one of the business of ours, it shall be when the Lord gives us the land, the Lord, not when we take the land, It's when the Lord gives us the land. They're constantly giving that honor to God because they know why they're able to go in and defeat those people. It's because God promised them. We will deal kindly and truly with you. Then she let them down the rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall. She dwelt in the wall, and she said to them, Get to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Afterward, you may go on your way. She was a smart cookie. She knew exactly where to send them, what to do. She thought through what plan was best for them to make it to the other side. She shows them how to escape. And and this is the moment that, that James chapter 2, verse 25, speaks of when it talks about her faith. And so I'm going to read it. It says, uh, Likewise, was Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she, saved, when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so is faith without works is dead. Now, this isn't saying that because of our works, we're, sa- we're saved. It's saying because we're saved, we'll have works. Because we understand who God is, because we know the power of our God, because we love our God, it's going to naturally bring works. Our works, it, Paul says, we are saved by faith, by grace of God alone. This isn't, this isn't contradicting that. Our faith should bring out works in us. Otherwise, do we really have faith in God if we're not willing to do the things he's called us to? And I'm not talking about big things, although some of these might seem big. I'm talking about, are you willing just to follow what he's already asked you to do? Are you willing to maybe forgive someone that he's called you to forgive that you don't want to? You know, are you willing to love on someone that's a little bit unlovely, right? Are you willing to show grace to somebody or mercy to somebody that needs it. That's works right there. That's us going in and being lights in a dark place. It's in doing the things that he calls us to do. That's faith with action. If you love God, it will cause you to move. We need to walk in the same kind of faith that Rahab walked in. Rahab's faith, what I, what I like about it as well, is it, it came with an expectation of obedience. I mean, she was given some very specific instructions to follow. It wasn't like she was saved and she got to run amok and do whatever. No, they were requiring something of her to be able to be saved that day. Um, It says in verse 17, so the men said to her, will we be blameless? um, uh, We will be blameless of this oath um, that you, that we have made and swear, uh, that we have made and sworn unless so here's, here's the catch, like, unless you do this, um, unless when we come into your land, you bind the scarlet cord in the window through which you have let us down, and unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, all your father's household and your home, so it shall be anyone that goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall remain guiltless. So they're telling Rahab, all right, we're going to save you, but... Unless you leave this scarlet cord, unless you hang it out the window, 
unless you have all of your family in your home, unless they stay in your home, if they even go out of, this, out of the house when we come, their, their blood is on their own hands. She, they're saying, like, you have a responsibility in this. The same for us. We have a responsibility in it. That picture of that, that scarlet cord is really cool because it, that color scarlet, it's red. This is a picture of the blood of Christ. Think about in Exodus, the Passover, when God told the people when um, the final plague was being poured out on the, on the Egyptians for not allowing Moses and, and the Israelites to leave, it was the firstborn son was going to be killed. And so the way that the angel of death was able to pass over the homes of the Israelites was they had to kill um, a spotless lamb. They had to take the blood from that lamb and they had to place it on the two doorposts in, in the homes that they were staying in. And they had to put it on the doorpost and that told the angel, uh, the angel of death, not that home. So picture that, score, that cord going out Rahab's window. The one scarlet cord hanging out there, that was a picture of the blood of Christ. That was a picture. The way that you are saved is when you put that cord out the window, that represented that blood had to be shed in order for there to be salvation. And so it's this beautiful picture. So when we were talking in our study like that, those challenge questions that, that we have that cause us to think like, okay, so where do we see Christ in the Old Testament? You know, sometimes people say, oh, God's not in the Old, Christ is in the Old Testament, just the new. No, there are so many pictures of Christ. Everything in the Old Testament that points to, points to Jesus and as well as in the New Testament. And we need to understand that as believers, like that scarlet cord was such a beautiful picture. And with Rahab, her faith saw results. What were the results that we saw? Well, we saw her family saved. We saw that... Um, her family obeyed what she asked them to obey. Picture that. Picture her telling the family, like, um, I know I'm a prostitute. I probably don't have a, a great name master, but this is what we're going to do. But they listened. They did exactly what she asked. Um, and I'm thinking, like, those results that Rahab now were having, what was that from? Think of Galatians 22 and the fruits of the Spirit. When you have God with you, it's love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the things that we gain when we walk with the Lord. Turn to Joshua chapter 6 because I'm going to read um, through quite a bit of it, actually, because I want us to get a picture of what Rahab had to do. Because sometimes we think, oh, okay, so she listened to them, she got saved. But let's just walk in her shoes for just a moment, like what it actually looked like that day. So we're going to start at verse 1. And this is um, talking about the actual, when the Israelites actually come in and they're actually taking over land, what God told them to do. It says, now Jericho was securely shut up um, because of the children of Israel. None, were, um, none went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, um, see that I have given you Jericho into your hand and its king and its mighty men and valor and you shall march around the city, um, all of you men at war, and you shall go around the city once. Then you shall do it six days. And the seven priests and the seven trumpets um, shall go before the ark. So we, we're seeing this picture of God is telling Joshua, you're going to go into the city. You're going to take your men. You're going to walk around the city once a day for six days. And what he also tells them in verse 18, it says, Now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make um, a noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth. So as they're walking through the city, it's in complete silence. Think of the discipline that had to take. This kind of told me right here why they left the women and children at home. <laughs> this was like, because you see him earlier say, Leave the women and the children because they can't do this. I know for us, we'd have been like, this would have been torture all in itself. <laughs> so he tells them to do this, and then he tells them, but on the seventh day, you're going to walk around seven times. So they go around this city a total of 13 times. Well, and I'm thinking to myself, what, what do you think they're thinking? Like, 
why so many times, Lord? Why do you have to do that? But it shows that they're obedient. Verse 15, it says, but it came to pass on the seventh day, they rose early about the dawning of the day, and they marched around the city seven times in that same day. And it wasn't until they blew the trumpet and that they shouted out loudly, because they probably had so much built in that they were just were as loud as can be. That's when the wall fell. That's when the wall tore down after they obeyed seven days, 13 times around the city. And what was the result? It said, only Rahab the harlot shall live. And she, um, and this is in verse 17, um, shall live. And she and all who are in her house, because she hid the messengers. It's saying, Rahab spared because she obeyed God. And um, Warren Wearsby commented on this because it talked about just what it must have taken, the discipline. Think about the discipline that it actually took for them to walk around that city that many times and wonder, you know, I'm going to read what he said because to me, he said it best. He says, could have God delivered the city, uh, the city to Joshua on that very first day? Certainly. But the requirement of six days of marching during when the people were not allowed to talk was a great means of discipline for the nation. Faith and patience goes together. Maintaining silence and waiting for God's appointed time requires discipline. Ouch. At least for me. Maybe not for you. See, picture them walking around the city. So now we see what they're doing and the discipline it required from them. But now let's be Rahab for a minute. Rahab's in her home. They're walking around the city. They're, they're could be hearing the rumblings of the rocks that, that are going to be falling down. And her family could be telling her, like, where are they going? I mean, they've been around this city three times. What are they doing? Maybe they're plotting to kill us. Like, think of the patience that it took her to stand firm and not think, okay, when they head around our house, that'll give us about an hour and a half, or however long, I don't know how long it took them to walk around the city. It could have taken them 10 hours. But that'll give us this much time to jump the fence and escape. You know, that, could, that would have been the thoughts in my head. I don't know. I would have been thinking, okay, what if they were lying? What if they didn't mean it? What if they were really just trying to trick me? And, but Rahab had to be patient. She had to be wise. She had to be discerning that these men were of God and they knew. And I think oftentimes for us, like, we need to understand, we need to show restraint. God might be doing something in our lives that's much bigger than we think. He might be making us wait for six months. You know, he might make us wait for, for six years, but whatever he's doing, it's for a greater purpose. Seven days didn't probably make sense to them. Six months may not make sense to us, but he's doing something bigger, something greater. Why? Because we know he loves us and he promises that to us. He's not ever going to leave us high and dry. He's always trying to refine us, to perfect our character, to grow us in his image, and we just need to have confidence in that. And maybe you've been waiting for a really long time and it feels like forever and you feel like, gosh, I'm about to jump ship. I'm about to head right over that wall because I need to. I can't take this even another minute. But imagine how different the story of Rahab would be told if she'd have done that. Imagine the legacy she wouldn't have left behind. I mean, what did she receive by obeying Christ so much more than she ever would have received by jumping that wall? She's got the protection of God now, something she didn't have before. She was in a city that God took down, but now she has the protection of God. We know now she's grafted in to the lineage of Christ. It says in Matthew 1, verses 5, it says, uh, Salmon begot Boaz, by Rahab, and Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Okay, so Rahab's faithfulness does what? It puts her in the lineage of Christ, a prostitute. Doesn't that tell you that it doesn't matter where you've been or what you do, you've done? God loves you so much, he'll put you right in his lineage. It's like we don't have to ever look back and feel guilty and feel horrible and feel that shame. We are a new creation in Christ. We need to understand there's nothing that we have done or could ever do that shocks the Lord. 
nothing, and there's nothing that will separate us. Think of Boaz. Who was Boaz? He married Ruth. He was an honorable man. Why do you think he was so honorable? Because he knew Rahab. He knew her story, what she had been through. That must have given him such compassion. It made him a stand-up guy. He knew hardship. How amazing is And he walked in that faith that he was taught. Um, Rahab's also mentioned in Hebrews 11, 31. So she and Sarah, only two women that are mentioned in the hall of faith. We've got Noah and Moses and Abraham and all these great men. But we have Sarah and a prostitute. That's mentioned. And what does it say? It says, by faith, by faith, Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. That's just a testimony of faith. That's just Rahab walking in what God has showed her to walk in, in him. We don't do things in our own strength. We do things with the power and the might of God. I think sometimes we forget that. I think sometimes we're these busy little bees, go, go, going. But we want to be filled with, why do we pray each time to be filled with his spirit? Because without it, what are we? We're worn out. We're just us. That's just no bueno. I'm just going to tell you. We need him. And we need to take a walk with that testimony of faith. Like, I read through this and I thought, I want to be like Rahab. I want to do those great things. I want to be fired up all the time. I don't want to run around drained and weary. I think sometimes we forget the power of our God. We forget that he is the one who does the work. We think that there's so much responsibility on us. It's like, no, it's him. We're just the little hands and feet that run along. I think he probably laughs up above when we're doing something. We think we're so great at it. He's probably like, oh, my gosh, Gloria, are you crazy? But I think we need to remember, you know, how far, and these are kind of things that I asked myself. So when I was done studying, I asked myself, like, how far are the effects of my faith being seen? You know, do the people around me think of me as someone who holds fast to my convictions? Or do I just run off into a ditch every time something gets tough? Do they see me as someone who's willing to put my complete faith in God when the hard things show up? It's hard sometimes doing those things that are a little tough, isn't it? Sometimes we want to just do all the easy stuff that looks nice and big bows on it. It's like sometimes God requires the hard things from us. Sometimes he asks us to stand firm in our faith and, and, and walk in the areas that we think, Lord, I just can't do it anymore. I just want to give in. I'm tired of trying to teach my child that. Or I'm trying, tired of witnessing to my mom about this. Like, they're, they're not listening. It's like, no, he's saying, you, you be salt and light. The power is me. You do what I've called you to do specifically. I'll actually do the work. And it's just understanding it's his work and not our work. He is as faithful today as he was in the time of Rahab. I think sometimes we forget because we don't necessarily see the water part in front of us, but we know we've seen water part in our lives. Like you cannot walk as a Christian for very long without seeing his power. You know, without seeing the proof of what he still does and is still doing. Think of, Brenda mentioned last week, the dreams that the Muslims are having. That's from God. We can't manufacture that. We can't create that. Today, more than ever. Like, this is the time, ladies. I feel like we need just a giant revival in us as women alone. Like, we need to stand up because there are things happening out there that if we don't stand up, who's going to? If the ones who know the power of God aren't out there speaking for him, what, who, who's left talking? A lot of people on Facebook, I'll tell you that, right? I'm so tempted to delete people. And every day, I, I have deleted a couple because I just can't take it another minute. But, but every day, I have to take a moment and think, but maybe... I'll post something about Christ and it'll affect him. You never know. Like I weigh out like the power of maybe possibly something that I post ministering to them more than their hate is killing me, right? We need to be women. I thought like when we have that modern women of faith that we, we compare to as we're going through our study, I mean, think of Corey Tin Boom. What did she do? It's like she was Rahab all over again. Now she wasn't a harlot, she was a woman of God, but what did her faith cause her to do? 
She took in those Jews. She hid them. They're coming to her door. She's sending them away. I mean, think of what she's doing, the risk that she took. It actually sent her to Ravensburg. She actually got sent to a concentration camp based on her being faithful to God. I think, gosh, would, would I be that faithful? Would I be able to withstand that? But what did she do when she was even there? She snuck in a Bible, and she ministered to every single person that would listen. And what happened? People got saved. That's powerful. And then what did she do when she left? She just didn't think like, all right, I've done a big work for the Lord. I'm all done. I'm going to take a nap now. No, she traveled everywhere talking about God. It was like it was never done. I'm thinking if I was Corrie ten Boom, I might have called it. Like, my life is mine now. I did quite a lot for the Lord, and I'm sure he's thankful, right? We think like that. I'm just being honest. No, her life was committed to the Lord, and she carried it all the way through until she died. She never stopped. It's like we need to be women that don't stop for the Lord. Amen?